I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss President Volodymyr Zelensky's upcoming visit to Washington, and we speak to Ukrainian blogger and TikTok creator Ksenia Solotokhina about Crimea, misinformation, and her hope for the future. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday, the 21st of December, day 301. And today, to discuss the most recent events in Ukraine and around the world, I'm joined by our assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley. And our guest today is Ksenia Solodokhina. Thank you so much to Ksenia for her time today. You can follow Ksenia's work on Twitter and TikTok. Just go to the handle at Xenia Solo. That's at X-E-N-A-S-O-L-O. Thank you very much. Francis, can I come to you first? What's the latest news from Ukraine? I I guess we'll we'll have to start with the astonishing upcoming visit of President Zelensky to Washington. Well, thanks, David, and good morning, afternoon or evening to our listeners around the world, depending on what time zone they're in. Yes, let's start with the leading story. Zelensky is leading the headlines again, as you say, because he will be meeting with US President Joe Biden and address Congress in Washington later today. This is very much a secretive visit that we've only heard about in the last sort of 14 or 15 hours or so. The intention being that it will send Russia a very strong message on Western unity. Uh, It comes on the same day as Russian President Vladimir Putin meeting his top military officials to assess the dire results so far in the war in Ukraine and set the goals for the next year. President Zelensky has tweeted, who, as I say, is en route to Washington as we speak. He said, Quote, on my way to the US to strengthen resilience and defence capabilities of Ukraine. White House spokeswoman has also said the visit will underscore the United States steadfast commitment to supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes. Now, important to emphasise that this is, of course, President Zelensky's first trip outside of Ukraine since Russian forces invaded back in February. And just to speak to the significance of this, Uh, There's been an open letter that's been published by Nancy Pelosi, the US House Speaker, who has said in her invitation to address Congress, which, of course, she formally has to do in order for this to take place later today. uh, And I'll read it in full. Dear Mr. President, it is with immense respect and admiration for your extraordinary leadership that I extend on behalf of bipartisan congressional leadership an invitation to address a joint meeting of Congress on Wednesday, December 21st, 2022. America and the world are in awe of the heroism of the Ukrainian people. In the face of Putin's horrific atrocities, Ukrainian freedom fighters have inspired the world with an iron will and an unbreakable spirit, fighting back against Russia's brutal, unjustified invasion. The fight for Ukraine is the fight for democracy itself. We look forward to hearing your inspiring message of unity, resilience and determination. Thank you for your leadership and consideration of this request. So we're expecting in UK terms to start seeing President Zelensky in Washington around 6pm. That will obviously vary depending on the time zones of listeners and it may have already happened by the time that uh, certain listeners are are speaking to this. But nonetheless, a very significant moment. I'm very happy to talk about why this is taking place and what we expect to come out of it, David. Yes, let's let's go to that. What what do we think that Vladimir Zelensky and his team want from this visit? Well, uh, they've actually already given a very explicit answer to that. One of U- uh, Ukraine's political advisors to Zelensky has said that it's really uh, offering an opportunity to explain what weapons explicitly that Kyiv needs. So he has said to you know, bang home this point, weapons, weapons and more weapons. It is important to personally explain why we need certain types of weapons, in particular armoured vehicles, the latest missile defence systems and long range missiles. Now, of course, this comes off the back of President Biden announcing nearly two billion in further military assistance for Ukraine. That includes the Patriot missile battery that we spoke about at length last week. But clearly the Ukrainians feel that they need more for 
the coming weeks and months. And obviously the big reason as to why that is the case is this expected offensive from the Russians on Kyiv. Uh, now, we've, as I say, already touched on that in detail at the end of last week, that this is the belief of the Ukrainian army is that there is, uh, this is going to be a sort of a pause in the war largely at the moment, whilst Russia recuperates some of its losses, uh, some of those mobilised soldiers come into play, and then an attempt to try and retake Kyiv in around February and March time. And so this is an attempt, we hear, by uh, uh, Zelensky to to really urge in private uh, to the, pre- the president and to the American public, of course, as well, and to the American Congress, which we know has some members in it who are less than positive about the idea of offering a blank check financially to Ukraine, that just spelling out exactly what weapons they need and to underline the vi- vital importance of this uh, military and financial aid. The other remark as well that they say in terms of the justification is is they've said this finally puts an end to the attempts by the Russian side to prove an allegedly growing cooling in our bilateral relations. I think that's really important as well, that this really sends a firm rebuke to the idea that the US is getting tired of providing support for Ukraine. Thanks, Francis. Um, just, just stay on this just a little bit, a little bit longer. There are other implications as well, um, symbolic and some historical echoes. Can you talk us through them? Sure. Well, I think it is important to put this in the context of what we saw yesterday. As I say, President Zelensky was leading the news for us yesterday as well with his stirring words in Bakhmut on the front line. Very dangerous place, of course, for all sorts of reasons, which I won't go into now. But his, I, I listened to his speech, which has um, uh, been relayed now that he's safely out of the of the war zone and the predictably stirring words uh, apparently delivered on the cuff. But of course, the importance of that now we see is that before him going to Washington on his first foreign trip award leaving the country he wanted to make it clear that he hadn't forgotten about the soldiers who were doing the fighting so whilst obviously significant for the reasons I talked about yesterday symbolically I think now we can understand why it was quite so important for him to go in order for for, uh, the Ukrainian soldiers who are fighting to see that he's not abandoning them not that they would think that but I think it just underlines the point but as I say I think the, the other symbolic significance of this is of course about American support of Ukraine for this winter and beyond and more broadly about Western support to it has it has to be said Churchillian echoes two weeks after Pearl Harbor uh, Churchill visited Washington for a three week stay at the White House he also addressed Congress and celebrated Christmas in 1941 with FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, of course we've th- that was vitally vitally important for the bonding process that forged between FDR and Churchill over that period they really strategized the the war very deeply over late night drinking sessions and and, uh, and it was, as I say, very, very important. These personal relationships forged one on one are absolutely integral. We see that again and again in, in warfare. So I think that this is also another very significant part of this. And yet I do think that it's important to at least register some concern that we're hearing from certain commentators. And I actually I share some feelings around this, which is that, of course, if Zelensky was absolutely convinced 100% that Western support was going to be forthcoming for the months ahead and and possibly even longer, then would he feel it necessary to go to Washington now? Uh, If he didn't, then uh, if he did, you know, he may not go. But the fact that he is going perhaps suggests that there is some concern perhaps um, amongst the Ukrainian leadership that that perhaps not, if not the US, that other other Western countries are wobbling for some of the reasons we've talked about in recent weeks. And that this is a really important moment to shore up that Western support. I was chatting to Hamish de Breton Gordon this morning, who of course is a regular on the podcast. I've commissioned him to write a piece for for us on on this theme, saying that you know, that in, in a sense, there is no doubt a concern I think amongst the Ukrainians that you know they've they've been fighting now and have have destroyed the reputation of the russian army in a manner that the west should be very very grateful for and really it's quite a sad thing that that zelensky is needing to still go and and essentially request further support and further weapons when as you know to quote nancy pelosi herself saying that democracy itself is on the line so as i say whilst i think in many ways this is a positive development i do think it's important to caveat with that with a sense of you know perhaps that this is indicative as well of a slight concern in Ukraine and amongst uh, Zelensky and his supporters that it, this is a really important moment to make sure that the West doesn't uh, bottle it. 
And just very quickly, what's the Russian reaction to this been? <laughs> well, you can imagine what their reaction is. They're not too chuffed about it, to put it mildly. Uh, they've said that nothing good will come from uh, President Zelensky's trip to Washington. They've said that they see no chance of peace talks with Kiev as a result. They've said that it would lead to a deepening of the conflict and something that would surely backfire for Kiev. Um, Dmitry Peskov has said the supply of weapons continues and the range of supplied weapons is expanding. All of this, of course, leads to an aggravation of the conflict. Conflict. This does not bode well for Ukraine. So they're claiming that this is a provocation, which, as I say, shouldn't really come as a surprise, given that the uh, Russians claimed that anything that uh, Ukraine did as a democratically sovereign nation, including forging closer alliances with Western powers, was a provocation, even if that was done through democratic sovereign means. So I don't think it should come as a great shock to us. But no doubt it's an embarrassing thing for the Kremlin and one that they will um, be ruining on, as I say, on this quite significant day when uh, Putin is going to be meeting his generals and strategizing for the uh, for the next few months of the war. Thank you very much uh, for that Francis that was very comprehensive and we'll bring you more coverage of what Zelensky says to conf- uh, to to Congress tomorrow and the American reaction and the world's reaction tomorrow on tomorrow's podcast. Um Francis just before we go to Ksenia uh, thank you uh, would you take us through just some other updates that we should know about? Of course. Well, I'll whiz through these because, as I say, the big news today is the one we've just been covering. But uh, the other interesting thing as well is that uh, President Putin yesterday has acknowledged that conditions in Russian-held areas of Ukraine are extremely difficult and has ordered the strengthening of Russia's borders as a consequence. Quite an admission there that things are in a difficult situation. Bear in mind that throughout the war, in the propaganda and everything else, for a long, long time, there was no articulation that anything was going wrong in Ukraine whatsoever. So quite an admission from him. Uh, in terms on the energy front, electricity supplies in the Kyiv region are at a critical level with less than half of the capital's power needs being resupplied following the brutal bombardment by Russian missiles and drone attacks. So just keeping an eye on that there, that things continue to be very serious in Kyiv and certain other cities. Um, And, of course, the the Ukrainian prime minister has also said that Ukraine must continue to prepare for new Russian attacks on its energy grid because Moscow wants Ukrainians to spend the Christmas and New Year period in darkness, which I think is is accurate from what we've seen. Uh, This is an attempt to uh, lead the Ukrainian people to want to end the war sooner over this very bleak winter. But as I've said before, I don't see that as being um, a consequence of this at all. Rather, it is only breeding a deeper defiance in the Ukrainian people people from what we can see. Um, Just two other quick stories. Uh, A Russian court has ordered the seizure of a billion dollar luxury resort belonging to a tycoon who's criticised Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine. It seized a hotel and marina in Sochi. Uh, owned by an oligarch called Oleg Deripaska, an aluminium magnate. And it's come, as I say, was urged by the... uh, He he urged the Kremlin to stop, um, or or at least that the the war was not going well. And and he was sort of publicly criticising the war. And they've obviously uh, come down on him very, very hard, which is, as I say, it comes as no shock. This is what what the Putin uh, and and his uh, oligarchic friends do um, and acolytes do. He's tweeted in March to say this uh, this man um, calling for peace, saying that we have already passed a point of no return. And he said that he warned that destroying Ukraine would be a colossal mistake. And so, as I say, he's paying the cost of that. And just lastly, and I think this should be seen as coming on the back of the uh, visit by President Zelensky to Washington. Russia's Medvedev, um, former prime minister, of course, as well, has uh, is meeting Xi in Beijing. And uh, he has uh, undertaken a surprise trip there, holding talks with him. And they've apparently discussed the Ukraine conflict. No other details have come out apart from the fact that there were some smiling photographs and uh, and a meeting between uh, Chinese and Russian uh, officials. They've said, we've discussed cooperation between the two ruling parties of China and Russia, bilateral cooperation with our strategic partnership, including on the economy and industrial production. We've also discussed international issues, including, of course, the conflict in in Ukraine, the talks were useful. But as I say, we're not getting any more out of that, but quite, as I say, concerning, no doubt, the fact that they, that again, that China is willing to quite so publicly meet prominent Russian figures. But because they haven't made any more remarks, it's very difficult to read too much into it. 
Well, thank you very much, Francis Sternley, for all of that. Thank you for taking us through the updates and uh, giving us an overview of President Zelensky's visit to Washington. Um, can I turn to Ksenia? Ksenia, thank you so much for, for joining us. We're, we're very, very um, privileged to, to be able to talk to you today. Um, for, for those people who aren't familiar with, with you and your work um, from TikTok and Twitter, could you just introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and, and a little about um, uh, the, the, the last year and the time before that. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Ksenia, but I usually go by Zena, and I'm a Ukrainian creator from Crimea. Um, and yes, I've been making videos about the situation in Ukraine um, and the live streams, so not only videos, but also live streams. Uh, and I started talking about Ukraine exclusively a couple of weeks before the full scale invasion. So a couple of weeks, uh, I think early February when, you know, everything was already, when everything felt rather intense uh, and something was definitely brooding in the air, but uh, still no certainty for what was about to happen. And then I sort of dedicated my online presence to introducing Ukraine to the people abroad, to the English-speaking audience, uh, trying to connect with them, trying to give Ukrainians voice and, of course, to explain my position as someone from Crimea uh, who had to live through the annexation. So, yeah, that's. I think that's about it. Well, there's a lot to a lot to talk about there, but could you just talk to us a little bit first about the last few months uh, um, since maybe October and since the the intensification of the Russian bombardments on the on the energy infrastructure? What what li- what has life like been for you? And in the lead up to Christmas as well, how how have you dealt with that? What what's been happening? Well, of course, uh, we were expecting something like this to happen. Uh, it was uh, something that they have been the Russians have been threatening for months. And for those of us who have been trying to keep up with the Russian news and the Russian uh, information sources, because we unfortunately all speak and (laughs) understand Russian, so we could uh, see this demand from the public, from the Russian public growing uh, to, you know, for the Russian army to attack and target our critical infrastructure. So it didn't really come as a huge surprise, but obviously it was still uh it, it's, it's so horrible right this is an attack on something so personal something so vital for a lot of people and uh with the winter time coming so yeah th- I, I don't think there is a, 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 I don't think a normal response is possible for something like this you know when someone is coming uh, literally for your livelihood and a lot of people uh, in Ukraine people like me uh, we work online we work, work remotely so this is like them literally coming for your livelihood for your safety for your warmth uh, for your electricity just yeah it's it's abominable but what you're gonna do <laughs> that's the neighbor that we have to live with Ksenia, you said um, something quite interesting there about, of course, how speaking Russian and understanding Russian. Lots of Ukrainians are exposed to what um, Russians say and talk about on social media. That That's something obviously not seen, I think, in the West. And um, I've heard a, a couple of people we've talked to have spoken about this before. But if, if possible, would you just give us a sense of what, what kind of things do you see? I mean, as you said just then, you had a sense that something was coming before it even started because, because as you said, demand was growing. So what do you see on sort of um, on Russian social media? Well, I would say it's like a call uh, to violence in a sense, because uh, so obviously there are different different layers, different groups of the uh, Russian people, Russian Internet users. But um, the majority of them are either, you know, silently approving of the war uh, or actively approving of the war. And so you can hear things like, yeah, just active calls to action, criticism of Putin, something that is rather unprecedented for uh, Russian society, knowing you know how strong the censorship is there. Uh, this has become a very often case uh, ever since the Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kharkiv. So people started criticizing Putin for uh, being too soft, uh, <laughs> for uh, treating you know Ukrainians too nicely uh, and stuff like this. So questions like, why do they still have electricity? Why do they still have internet? Why can they still post their little uh, TikToks and, you know, their little tweets? Uh, We should just bomb them into oblivion. So it was just growing, growing and growing. Uh, And it was coming not only from the people online, although, of course, overwhelmingly, especially amongst the pro-war, more sort of alt-right Russian crowd, but even, you know, from the people you know. And in my case, even from my family, 
family members because my grandmother is Russian and she lives in Russia and she's an avid Putin supporter. And she started criticizing him for this exact reason, for not fighting too efficiently, for not destroying Ukrainian infrastructure, for not uh, paralyzing Ukrainian military, so and so on and so forth. So yeah, I just I would say this is a an overall trend for a very significant number of Russian people that unfortunately yeah, we understand because we speak Russian. Ksenia, you spoke, you mentioned earlier that you grew up in Crimea and you, and you, and you, and you did say that you know, you've, had, you've had to deal with the annexation and the, the conflict since 2014 and before that. Um, I'd like to spend, if possible, just quite a bit of time on this because I think it's really important uh, to try and explain and understand um, Crimea and, and your background. So would you talk to us about Crimea? What was your life like there? What was it like growing up? Well, it, it was quite literally normal, <laughs> regular Ukrainian childhood. Uh, Crimea, of course, is a predominantly Russian-speaking region, but we have plenty of Russian-speaking regions in Ukraine, so we didn't really uh, stand out in this regard. But uh, we would learn Ukrainian at school. We would identify as, well, Crimean first. Uh, regional identity is very strong there. Uh, and then we would identify as Ukrainian, uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainian. So, yeah, it was just a normal childhood in this very southern, sometimes too southern for its own sake, region, you know, by the sea with your family, with your friends. So <laughs> just absolutely normal, you know, everything. Uh, of course, later on when I would, you know, go back and try to analyze to what started happening, especially ever since 2004, 2005, uh, so pretty much ever since the uh, Yushchenko Yanukovych presidential election and the Orange Revolution, I would see the signs of the growing Russian presence in the region and uh, the information war and how we, the youth of Crimea, how we have been targeted by it. But when you're living in it in the moment, obviously, you're, you know, you're just a kid or a teenager. You're not, uh, you're trying not to overthink. Well, you're probably not even going to think about this stuff uh, until, you know, it happens to you and your uh, reality bubble bursts. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, before 2014, it was just, you know, just normal, normal existence. Can I just um, ask you to go a bit further there? I mean, you said you see, you see, looking back, you see these signs of growing Russian presence and sort of information war. Um, like what exactly? What, what did you see? So... This is something that it's hard to talk about without sounding like, you know, paranoid <laughs> person, like, you know, like something from a movie. Uh, but yeah, there was this growing presence of what I now now realize is the, well, call them, you know, the Russian secret services, call them any other Kremlin affiliated organizations, but it was the gradual soft power spread. For instance, we had the so-called Russian cultural centers in Crimea. The first one was opened in Simferopol, that's the uh, capital of Crimea, because Crimea Crimea had the autonomy, uh, it, it had its own parliament, it had its own administrative structure. Uh, and so in Simferopol was the first one, another one was in Sevastopol and several years later. So they would organize all of these pro-Russian events, you know, they would invite children, uh, sort of, I, I don't know, they would announce a competition, for instance, like in my case, because I used to write poetry in Russian, a poetry competition would be announced and you would win and you would be invited to this event, uh, you know, given some prizes, have some pictures taken. And then these pictures would be used in the Russian media uh, as, you know, as a way to express, oh, look at all these Crimean children, look at them posing in this Russian event, and they're probably pro-Russian, uh, you know, stuff like this. Then there were organizations openly recruiting, uh, like, high schoolers, trying to get them into the Russian universities. Uh, and one of the conditions in order to get to the Russian university for free, if you wanted to as a Crimean, was to participate in the what I now realize were pretty much like separatist, me like, meetings. So, you know, you have to go out and like paint a Russian flag uh, on the fence and, you know, stand next to it while the people who are organizing all this take pictures of you. So it was ridiculous stuff like this. And looking back now, I'm, of course, I, I realize what it was and I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, how, how was that allowed? <laughs> how could this possibly have happened? But yeah, this is, this was unfortunately a part of our reality. And obviously it was not a grassroots movement. It wasn't just people, uh, you know, wishing to enter Russia, whatever, wishing to be annexed by Russia. It was carefully orchestrated and organized from somewhere in Moscow. Can you talk to us a little bit about 2014? What did you see of, of the annexation and what, what did you do? How did you react? 
Uh, so I was there before, right before it happened, and then I returned right after. So I wasn't there physically uh, for the month of February. Well, it, it, it began on February 20th, and uh, then it was rather quickly followed by a hoax referendum. Obviously, it was not a real referendum. Uh, but I remember receiving a phone call from my mother, who was there at the time, and it was just, you know, this very sort of fatalist, this just, just very gloomy phone call. It sounded like, you know, a lost goodbye. Uh, she called me and she said, well, something weird is happening. You know, the Russian army is on the streets. We don't know what's going to happen. Like, we love you. Um, but you know, obviously later it turned out that it was a, uh, as we now know, the softest uh, side, possible side of the Russian aggression and Russian occupation that we have faced back then. Uh, but yeah, it was still rather scary. So it was the army first, uh, then it was just announced all over the place that soon they're going to throw the uh, referendum. Uh, and yeah, then they just, uh, as they always do, the Russians always do this, uh, forge the results <laughs> and sort of announce that that uh, Crimea is now a part of Russia. And yeah, that was about that. And when I returned, it was already it was already Russia and it was just a huge shock to the system. And we know, well, thank you very much for sharing that. That's absolutely fascinating and, and, and terrifying, really. Um, that period, obviously, from 2014 to today, this period of invasion and resistance and warfare, especially in Donbass in the east, um, I mean, we, we see it reflected, I think, in how we report on this. I mean, we try and, you know, we, we, we on, in the podcast we say, you know, it's day 300 and I think it's 302 now. But of course, that's day 302 since the sort of full scale invasion of Ukraine, not just the, the annexation of Crimea and, uh, and, and the fighting in, in the Donbass. Um, I'd be interested to hear how you think um, experiencing this invasion and experiencing this conflict fr fr you know, from, from back in 2014 uh, uh, impacts your views and understanding of, of 2022, of the current full-scale invasion? Mm, well, I mean, obviously it all began in 2014, right? I think it's important to understand that if you want to understand uh, the root of this aggression, if you want to uh, look for the key, uh, you have to realize that it didn't start in February of this year, it began in February of 2014. And the fact that Russia was allowed to get away with it uh, is largely to blame for what we're seeing right now, for this huge, tremendous escalation that they have started. Um, but yeah, what happened in 2014, it kind of felt, it, it made me feel absolutely hopeless. Uh, I felt like, you know, there was no justice in the world and <laughs> uh, like everything is over because you, you know, you grow up existing in your own little bubble, believing in those things, you know, the, the silly concepts such as international law, you know, and <laughs> borders and stuff like this. And then one day you just wake up and you realize that all of this is a lie. Uh, and so I, it hit me pretty fast and not only me, but my family as well, that there's going to be a, there's going to be a continuation to that. Uh, so when my family moved from Crimea soon after the annexation, this was our main goal was to try and get away as far from Russia as possible because we knew that, you know, something, something is coming. They didn't receive proper repercussions. They didn't, they were not punished for what they did. And so, of course, they're going to continue, you know, in the classic KGB uh, way. Well, Putin is a former KGB agent after all. Uh, so, yeah, it, it explained a lot. It predicted a lot of what was going to happen. It explained the pattern to me and it explained to me you know what it is that we're dealing with which is a rather ruthless inhumane uh, enemy that has absolutely no regard for other people for people people's lives for the law so yeah i hope that makes sense no absolutely thank you um you mentioned y y you and your family moved away it'd be it'd be really interesting i think to hear a little bit about um where you moved to and also just a little bit maybe about the cultural differences that you found um, moving somewhere else in Ukraine. You know, we know, we know it's a, a huge country. There's all sorts of different uh, cultures and um, religions across Ukraine. So how did, what did you see when you moved from Crimea? It was a bit of a culture shock <laughs> uh, because we moved to Volyn, and Volyn is the region uh, in the western parts of Ukraine. It borders uh, Poland and Belarus. Uh, and uh, first of all, just the nature was completely different. It's so beautifully green, uh, and it's just a very, very nice place to be, a very relaxed place to be. Growing up in western Crimea, uh, it was like growing up in a, in a frying pan. Uh, it's extremely hot, it's very dusty, uh, very 
salty, lots of salty lakes we have in our region. Um, and all of a sudden, it's like you are in this uh, fairy tale book. <laughs> Everything is green, and there are these forests and mushrooms and stuff. Uh, and yeah, the people were extremely welcoming. Although I think, especially among the older people, there was a bit of a confusion as in, you know, why? Why would you possibly move from Crimea? Because it's important to understand that for the post Soviet people, uh, people who spend most of their lives in the Soviet Union, Crimea was this like paradise on earth, right? This is the place that you would go to uh, for a very expensive vacation. Majority of the Soviet workers could not afford something like this. Or this is something, if you're lucky, you will get so, like a paid tour from your factory. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was seen as this paradise of fruit and wine and the sea. And so to imagine someone, uh, you know, volunteering to <laughs> move from there, yeah, that was a bit of a nonsense. And a lot of people were like, why, why, why did you, why would you move? And we're like, well, I mean, the, the, the occupation. <laughs> what do you mean, why did we move? Uh, but yeah, for a lot of people, uh, it didn't, well, it, it kind of, in a sense, you know, Crimea sort of mattered or valued more in their eyes. But I think now uh, the majority of people understand very well why we did this. So, yeah, now we have this uh, better understanding, uh, you know, among each other. So, yeah, but yeah, it was it was a nice, nice, very pleasant shock. And also the people were extremely, extremely welcoming, just a very strong sense of community. Uh, yeah, it, it, it was a good it was a good decision. Well, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, yes, I echo that. We, we, when Dominic Nichols and I travelled through uh, Volin in, in July to get to Kiev, pe people were very, very helpful and very understanding of our of our lack of Ukrainian and um, Dom's Serbo-Croat and my smattering of Czech, and they were extremely helpful in helping us helping us get across the border and and, and onto the capital. So yes, can definitely echo that. Can I can I ask? Um, looking back to Crimea, are you able to keep in touch with friends or fr from Crimea? And if so, what do you hear from them, or if if anything? Uh, it's been uh, less and less gradually over the years. Uh, at first, of course, it was much more active. Uh, but then, well, for natural reasons, when you move and when you move away and, you know, you have a completely different life, uh, you just tend to... Uh, you know, just grow distance from uh, the people. But at the same time, a couple of years ago, certain laws, uh, uh, well, I don't know if you have heard about the Russian constitutional amendments, but uh, some of the amendments that they have introduced, uh, they made it, it, it was rather dangerous before, uh, to, you know, communicate, for instance, and to express any sort of oppositional uh, position or to communicate with people who are considered, could be seen by the Russian government as a hostile, whatever. And they see a lot of people as hostile, even if you're not hostile to uh, Russia. Uh, but after those amendments, uh, th there is now a criminal punishment, for instance, for questioning the so-called uh, territorial integrity uh, of Russia. And of course, this means annexed territory such as Crimea. Um, and when I wanted to write a thesis, my master's thesis on Crimean identity and everything that had to do with Crimea, I unfortunately had to abandon the idea of interviewing people just because of those amendments. It, it would be extremely dangerous for them because despite the fact that the uh, occupation of Crimea is often perceived by the mainstream public as the sort of more, you know, as a softer version, uh, it is, it, it's very much not. It's still the occupation and a lot of people are actively persecuted, especially the uh, native population of Crimea, Kirimli, Crimean Tatar. Uh, they're facing active, active persecution from the Russian uh, government. So, yeah, I, of course, wouldn't, you know, try to do something to uh, put their life and health in danger. So, yeah, it was just growing less and less and less. And the people that uh, I still talk to, uh, I, it's, it's not that often, but uh, everything they tell me is rather depressing. It's like witnessing, you know, something that you love dearly, a region that you love so much just dying slowly from afar and you cannot really do anything because you have no power, no control over it. Earlier, Xenia, you said um, in 2014 you felt hopeless, like there was nothing you could do and it was sort of inevitable what was happening. I was just, just wanted to ask before, I know Francis has got some questions, so if it's okay, I'll bring him in. But I wanted to ask quickly, how do you feel now? Do you still feel hopeless or do you think, or, or, or has the re resistance and the... Uh, and and the way the war has gone this year um, ignited something else for you. Well, yes, rather weirdly, I think, and, and sometimes I'm mad at myself for feeling this way, but I do feel hope now. Uh, I feel hope because of the 
because of the thanks to our army and the resistance of our army, thanks to a bunch of the stupid decisions made by the Kremlin, uh, because politically speaking, the moment they decided to throw the a bunch of other fake referenda uh, in Kherson and in Zaporizhia and in Donbass, right? Uh, what they did, they pretty much put Crimea back on the table because before that, Crimea was this you know special little flower. Uh, it was separate. Uh, every other uh, region that they would occupy or every other region that they would take under control, such as Donetsk, parts of, of Donetsk and Luhansk, for instance, they didn't have the same status. Uh, Crimea was very special in this regard. But now, all of a sudden, they're all equal. They're all fair game. So, of course, seeing this happening, yeah, it does give you hope. But at the same time, I don't know. It's just it's been <laughs> it's been too long and it's been a lot. Uh, and I personally I believe that the decision, you know, about the fate of Crimea and everything that has to do with it, of course, has to be in the hands of the army. And, you know, whatever the decision is going to be, I will fully support it. But yes, I, I do feel more hopeful than, you know, compared to what was a couple of years before. Well, thank you very much for answering all my questions. Um, Francis, uh, you've been listening to all of this. I know you have a couple. I do. And thank you, Zena. Really interesting to hear your perspective on, on this question of Crimea and your own experiences. Thank you. Um, my first question relates just off the back of what you were saying there about your uh, finding feeling more hopeful about Crimea. There's been some speculation, uh, which we've touched on on the podcast, that in order for this war to end, it would be for President Zelensky to sign away Crimea um, and and give it to Russia. And as a result of that, then the war can, can you you know, it would be a, an off ramp for Putin, and it, it, particularly if you were uh, as part of that to leave the annexed territories. I don't think this would happen. I hasten to add, but this has been the speculation. I just wondered what your response is to that idea of of Crimea no longer having a say it's to its own future and and being sort of signed off like that. Do you think that's possible? Do you see that as likely? And do you think that's what the Crimean people would want? Thank you for your question. Um, well, if that were to happen, and honestly at this point I wouldn't be surprised if anything were to happen, uh, but if that was the case, that would be a huge mistake because this is pretty much exactly what have happened in 2014. Uh, this is what the international community just predominantly closed its eyes on what happened and allowed uh, Putin to get away with it. Uh, and uh, look look where it led us to, right? Crimea was used as a staging area for the further invasion uh, into Ukraine, and it has been used as the staging area for years, right? So for years, uh, you could have seen from, you know, the satellites and or just from uh, talking by the locals that uh, the Russian military presence has been growing enormously with every day. Uh, and uh, yeah, and it led to an inevitable result. So if it were to remain in Russia, I don't think there is any possible guarantee uh, that would prevent them from doing this again, you know, only maybe in a decade or a couple of decades. So it all began in Crimea and it all must end in Crimea. Uh, and ideally, of course, diplomatically, perhaps with its uh, status looked at by the independent commission, uh, maybe from the UN, maybe from other organization. But in the worst case scenario, yeah, there could also be, uh, from at least what I heard, there could be a potential military scenario as well. But it has to be dealt with. It cannot be given uh, to Putin because the very uh, it is the essence of this injustice that has happened is that uh, if your neighbor, right, a foreign country just decided to take over a part of your territory and it went completely unpunished and this should not be the precedent. It shouldn't have been the precedent and it should be fixed. So, yeah, well, I hope that answers it. <laughs> it does very much so. And just staying on Crimea for one more, if I may. What was your reaction to the Crimea bridge attack by Ukraine when the bridge connected to Crimea that Russia had built after 2014 was struck and large parts of it were destroyed? Just I want to get that sense of, of, of was that a shock? How did you feel when you saw that? Not to sound you know, like a sadist or something, but I was ecstatic. <laughs> And I made I made a video about this on TikTok. It was, I think, one of the best things to have happened. One of the best news that have um, happened during the full scale invasion. Uh, and a lot of people misinterpreted this. They thought that I was oh this blood hungry Ukrainian. Um, 
this bridge was not only a, well, still is, unfortunately, the damn thing still stands. Uh, not only was it a massive military uh, facility, right, because it's used for military purposes, first and foremost. Uh, Crimea, before before the Russian annexation, it was connected to the Russian parts to Krasnodar region by ferry, and it was more than enough for the civilian purposes. The bridge was built uh, for military purposes, so it was the destruction of this, uh, a supply chain that was allowing uh, for Russian uh, occupation of the Ukrainian south and the destruction of it, the damage of it, alongside with Antonievsky Bridge and Kherson region, was uh, a part of the reason why I believe we saw Russian withdrawal from Kherson. So it was massive, but it was also seeing the symbol, this disgusting symbol of the Russian occupation of this, uh, you know, of, of them just taking us under control, uh, of them forcing their will onto us, seeing it just lit up, and uh, yeah, it was it was beautiful. I think. <laughs> My Crimean soul rejoiced when that happened. It was, uh, it, it, it was beautiful. It was nice to see it. And I'm sure that was part of the, the justification for the attack is that it would, would, would trigger that reaction amongst Ukrainians and people from Crimea such as yourself. Um, just moving on to TikTok, I, I must confess off the bat, I'm not intimate with TikTok. I don't have it, although uh, I know David Knowles and his, with his uh, social media cap on is very familiar with it. And The Telegraph has a TikTok, but uh, I don't. We do, but, but I don't think we've done anything as successful as, as, no. as David, <laughs> unfortunately. So. I, I, I can believe that. Uh, no offence, David. Uh, I would say, yeah, it's not something that we're uh, as, as, as fluent in, I don't think as you are, Zenia. But um, just wanted to ask you on this. Um, when we, one thinks of TikTok here, it's very much a certain generation, a sort of Gen Z thing. And that may not be the case in Ukraine. And do let me know if it's not. But I just wanted to get a sense from you about whether there is a difference in attitude, even a very nuanced one, between uh, younger people, what we would articulate as sort of Gen Z, and perhaps millennials who you see on TikTok. It, or, or just sort of summarising the, the differences in attitudes or the similarities in, in attitudes towards the war across perhaps different social media platforms. It'd just be interesting to get your sense on that. Hmm. Well, definitely uh, there is a difference, of course, depending on the platform. And yes, age is uh, a part of it. Uh, TikTok in Ukraine is very much a young people app. And even among certain young people, it's still kind of, you know, frowned upon as uh, the silly dancing app. Uh, but uh, I think it's important to not underestimate something with TikTok's reach and something with its algorithm. I think it is currently one of the few platforms that uh, can potentially allow allow just, you know, a random person like myself, like a complete nobody with no connections, uh, to grow audience organically and to reach out to people and to, you know, have their voice heard. So this, I think, this it's an incredible power of TikTok. Uh, obviously, it's extremely flawed and TikTok was also a part of the, still is a part of the information war and this is where a lot of misinformation about Ukraine uh, and Russia and, well, pretty much anything you can imagine is being spread daily. So, of course, just like with any other social media platform, it's, it's important to fact check, right? It's important to look uh, at your sources. But at the same time, you know, for this sort of genuine storytelling for person to person connection, I think it's been great. And I'm seeing that more and more uh, Ukrainians are realizing that as well. I have seen a lot of Ukrainians starting their own uh, TikTok accounts and uh, trying, you know, to reach out to the world and tell their side of things just to sort of uh, have their voice heard. And and yeah, and it's it, it recently it stopped. I think well, gradually we're seeing this shift, uh, you know, from it, in it going from this just sort of dancing app for teenagers uh, to just a great you know informational tool, an informational weapon. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm not sure if I answered your question, <laughs> uh, but uh, I hope that makes sense. No, it's very interesting hearing your perspective on this. And just one last question from me on, on this theme. You talked about the information war. Can you just summarise for us and perhaps perhaps let me know, you know, some of the, 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 the posts that you've done that have gained particular traction, just how important you think the information war has been since the invasion in February? Mm, I think definitely important and extremely important and there was a key difference i think in the way well at least uh from what i see like how i was approaching for instance uh my platform and how i see uh the russian propaganda approaching uh their things because they very often try to mimic after us <laughs> uh because what we do a lot of ukrainians we share our lived experience 
you know, we do not have like a corporation or, you know, the government official standing behind you with a, with a bat, like a FSB Mayor Vasily uh, whispering in your ear what you have to say. It was very organic and it allowed for us to share our pain and to share our voice. One of my first videos that went viral, it, it went viral because of it, it was controversial and a bit misinterpreted, but <laughs> uh, it was it was the video where I said that uh, it's so weird to see, you know, all this uh, mass hysteria in the beginning of February, everyone talking every day like, oh, tomorrow Russia is going to attack Ukraine, Russia is going to attack Ukraine. And yet one thing that's missing is the Ukrainian voices. So for me, my part in all of that was not trying to, you know, fight for the cause necessarily, but just trying to speak my truth and to share my truth and to share the pain and, and you know, and the joy and all of that. And I think this is one of the reasons why so many people are claiming that, oh, Ukrainians are winning information war. And then you will have the naysayers being like, oh, it's Zelensky, he's a comedian, you know, he has the Sean Penn's Oscar, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, it's not so much about the government, it's about the, the people. It's about the people speaking their truth from the heart. And yeah, it's a bit cheesy, but yeah, that's that's the way I see it. Well, thank you, Francis, uh, for your questions. And thank you very much, Ksenia, for your, for your answers. It's been fascinating. We're starting to get to the end of our time together today, um, unfortunately. But uh, Ksenia, is there anything we haven't spoken about or um, anything you, you want, you think our, our listeners uh, should, should understand or know about? No, I think we talked about the majority of it. Just please keep in mind that Crimea is Ukraine. <laughs> and it's, I know it sounds a bit uh, old and a bit tired and for some people obvious, but it's not. It's very important to keep in mind and that the injustice that has been done in 2014 is largely to, bl to blame for the uh, problems that we're facing right now. So yeah, just keep, keep us in your, in your heart, <laughs> keep us in your prayers and thank you. Thank you. Um, well, let's, I think we should go to our very final thoughts. Um, Francis, can I come to you first? Uh, Zenia, obviously, you, you've just given us what sounded like a final thought, but if you'd like to come in and add something onto that, you'd be more than welcome. But Francis Sterling. I just wanted to end with an interesting story that I saw yesterday uh, from the Ukrainian Bible Society, which says that demand has more than doubled since Russia's invasion, as many look for divine guidance or protection. And it's quite, a, as I say, quite an interesting story going into how there's been a distribution of, of more than 136,000 Bibles um, uh, it were in 2020. But in the first nine months of the war this year, that figure has more more than double to 359,000. British Christians alone donated about 168,000 Bibles and scripture-based books. And indeed, priests in Kiev have talked about this resurgence in faith among the population and have told our paper that congregations haven't dwindled despite an exodus of regular churchgoers overseas. And I should say that this tallies very much with my experience talking to people at the uh, Ukraine Cathedral here in London, which um, there's going to be an episode about over the Christmas period, who have also described a real renaissance in people attending church. Now, I think it's important to say that that doesn't necessarily mean a religious revival, but it does show a cultural one. And I think it undermines, it underlines this really important point, which is that culture is a spiritual anchor for people. Yet in, in, in Ukraine, something more is going on, as we heard yesterday. We're also seeing how high culture, literature, art, can become injected with a sense of meaning that's absent in so much of contemporary art and literature in many more sort of stable, inverted commas, Western countries. High culture in the 20th century, uh, sorry, in the, well, early 20th century, late 19th century was idealist. It was optimistic, uh, albeit experimental. But then you had the horrors of, of the world wars and it meant that the myth of the future went into shock. All art could do was reflect the present, if it could even do that. Yet in Ukraine, it's striking to me how... It's reflecting the present horrors, but it's also seeming to keep some of that sense of optimism or at least restoring it. It's not just reflecting horror and combating tyranny, but it's offering an optimistic vision of the future. 
And as a British person whose <laughs> contemporary culture is built on the rather wizened cynicism, it's quite remarkable and moving to see a country's culture capable of, of doing this. It's something we've lost, I think, but Ukraine has retained and, and regained in a very powerful way. And it's another reason, I think, why it will be impossible for Russia to win this war, because even if Ukraine were to suffer significant military setbacks, such cultural vitality always wins in the end. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, Ksenia, would you like uh, your very final thoughts for our, for our audience as our guest? Yeah, this has been the war that I think awakened something in the people, not only in Ukraine, but across the globe as well. It was interesting to see people just so genuinely feeling for what we're going through and this feeling of unity, this realization among so many, well, millions of people globally, this this empathy, you know, the understanding of the importance of what's going on and the depth of it all. And uh, yeah, just the connection that we all of a sudden discovered with each other. So yeah, thank you. Thank you all for that. Thank you for your support. We wouldn't have made it so far, of course, first and foremost, without our our army, but uh, also without the Western support, without our partners. So thank you for staying with us. And uh, yeah, all the best to you. (laughs) Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk slash audio. And sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk we do read every message and we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world ukraine the latest is produced by louisa wells and giles gear and today on twitter claire hubble